Well, as is so often the case, once you start doing something and investigating some part of the Bible, it starts to morph and you get more of it and it takes you in different directions. And my last uh, talk had to do with uh, this 2 Timothy 2.15 is, is saying that women will be saved in childbearing, but we know that can't be true, so what does it mean? And basically we came out and said, look, it, uh, it, it, it saves women from the shame of Eve, the, the sort of the female shame of the fall is, is uh, 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 compensated by childbearing, and this is where women can find uh, their honor. And of course, all Christians need to stay in the faith and love and honor God and, and, and this sort of thing. So it's not that childbearing itself saves you in a salvific way. Uh, way. But then I went off and read the Christian Post. And maybe you read the Christian Post and maybe you read Christianity Today or some other of these places. But this is a typical online Christian source of news and thought and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and they do a pretty good job. But of course, uh, something's going to roll along as I'm scrolling there, looking through, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't let it go. And this is an article from a fellow by the name of Philip Payne, and it's from April 19th, 2023. And it says, does Timothy 1, 2, 12 to 15, prohibit women from teaching or having authority over men? Yes, it does. Absolutely. But here is one more progressive Christian theologian who is trying to slice the salami ever thinner. And then as you slice it down and slice it down and slice it down, you find a kernel of pepper and you say, look, salami is made of pepper. But it isn't. Because if you go back from that, and back from that, and back from that, and then the whole salami, you see, wait a minute, it's not made from pepper. And so, I'll say this a couple of times, but taking text out of context is a pretext. And all of this worldly feminist stuff about women in the pulpit, women as bishops, it it. It degrades women, it hurts women and men, it hurts the church, and it purposefully and willfully ignores very clear scripture. So what I'd like to do is just walk you through this. I'm going to go through, read a little bit of the article, give some commentary, read a little bit of the article, give some commentary, and then, and then wrap it up. So let's, let's try that. So he starts out saying, I used to believe that 1 Timothy 2.12 teaches... I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. It's funny already because he thought that it taught exactly what it says. <laughs> but taking this as a universal prohibition ignores that this letter addresses a specific local problem. So we're going down. It's not the whole salami. It's going to be a little peppercorn. A local problem of false teachers deceiving women, and that this passage has only one imperative, and that is to let women learn. In in silence. Okay, okay, but this is these these are his words. Furthermore, the translation "I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man" is dubious for four reasons. Now we're going to go through the four reasons. Uh, but first, I'd like to say a few things. Um, uh, he says that he used to. And this is what we see with a lot of these progressives. You know, I used to believe the Bible just as it is. But what happened? The world, the flesh, and the devil happened. That's what happened. You didn't get a revelation from God. There wasn't any big breakthrough in the Greek. None of this happened. Feminism happened. The LGBTQ push happened. Um, black can be white, cats can go out with dogs. In fact, some people are cats and dogs. Um, this is what happened. This is, this is really shading this uh, interpretation. So he says that he used to. Uh, he used to just read the Bible. 
Uh, but the doctrines of demons that Paul refers to are in this very book, 1 Timothy. Uh, and they've pushed his conscience. Uh, I did a sermon on consciousness, conscience, and you're, you, you, can't, you can trust it a little bit, but you can't completely trust your conscience unless you've populated it with biblical truth. If you populate it with the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're going to get this kind of stuff. So what it does, it, or what it means, is that he's going to try to incorporate things into the Bible that he loves, and 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 this is called syncretism. And so we incorporate things from oh I don't know Hinduism like karma. Well that seems right, and I can be a Christian, I can believe in karma, I can pay it forward, and all these kind of, and and so. Uh, you see these sort of half truths and small truths. I think Thomas Aquinas also said, you know, wherever we find truth, we can use it. So, uh, but, but this leads to pulling something out of Hinduism, pulling something out of Buddhism, and then you become a Baha'i, which is just kind of a, a mix of all these things. So, not, not a good road to travel down. But no place in the Bible do we see women taking the role of a pastor or a teacher in the, in, in the New Testament. Uh, no books were written by women. Uh, the word here in 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, where uh, Paul says, I will not permit a woman, is in relation to the desire to do something. So this permit is there's a desire to do something and you permit it or you don't permit it. So the women are clearly desiring to teach but Paul does not permit that as inspired by God. And this has been going on since Genesis 3 when Eve tried to take the lead and came out from under the leadership of her husband and things went quite badly. Even Tim Keller, who is quite a progressive uh, uh, guy and has some pretty liberal ideas, uh, made a go uh, Gospel Coalition video, and he says, whatever you make of this verse, it is an injunction of some sort. It is, it is not permitting something. And to use it to say, well, the only thing it really means is women should learn. No, there's an injunction here. The whole verse is not just to say women should learn. Well, men should learn. You know? So, uh, you know, so e e even other voices are saying, oh, you know, there's something clearly forbidden here. Uh, and, and it's very often then this progressive liberal writers, they take scripture and they twist it to mean the exact opposite. Or they use other references and they twist them to mean the exact opposite. Please, if you're interested in the role of women in the church and in society and that kind of thing, according to the Bible, uh, look at Mike Winger's series on this. And, and he's got, I think it's eight videos. The average time of the videos is two and a half hours or something like that. I mean, I think one of them is like six hours and another guy like two, maybe just average time of three and a half hours. I mean, they're big, and, and, and he does a really good job researching this. And he went in as more egalitarian, which this fellow Payne is. And he came out much more, you know, complementarian, which is, you know, we have men and women complement each other, but they have very different roles, obligations, and authorities. So please, please take a, a look at that, and I'll put a, a link in the description. So, you know, this is, this is Satan at work. These are the doctrines of de demons, and this is warping this world. So the separate roles of men and women who are one, one men and women who are one in Christ, but with separate authorities and responsibilities, it's reflected in the church. It's reflected in Christ's submission to the Father in the Godhead. Uh, and this is a theme that if we ignore it, well, we ignore it at our peril. And we are absolutely ignoring this uh, today. We are falling victim to feminism and cultural Marxism, and uh, it's, it's you know wreaking havoc in uh, the church. We have uh, female pastors, 
uh, female bishops. These are some of the, the, the most obvious uh, and open rebellion against uh, Holy Scripture. Uh, and it's moved into every denomination except the Catholic Church. I don't think as of this date the Catholic Church has any female uh, priests, but it's coming. It's absolutely coming. Well, he continues. First, the Greek word, the old NIV translated as to have authority, authentine, authentine, is best translated to seize authority. Okay, the word's first occurrence clearly meaning exercise authority is three centuries later according to Saint Basil in his letters 69 line 45 he the Bishop of Rome may himself exercise full authority authentesi in this matter selecting men capable of enduring the hardships of a journey the New Testament uses a different word for exercising authority, and that is exusizo. In Paul's day, authentine could mean either to dominate or, more commonly, 21 times, to assume authority by seizing it. Okay, I mean, this is typical of progressive writers and the salami idea that I mentioned before, we slice it thinner and thinner and thinner so that we can make a point that actually misrepresents the, the context, okay? It's totally unrelated. Uh, this letters uh, from the library of St. Basil is a red herring, uh, and we should use scripture to interpret scripture. I'm not saying it's irrelevant. But we've got something here. Is it to dominate and seize, or is it to exercise authority? Well, either way, if, the, if men are supposed to have this level of authority, we're supposed to be doing this, these things, and you come in and either exercise authority or take it away from who rightfully should be using it, I, it doesn't really change things. But it's, you know, it kind of gets you wobbly and it gets you thinking about other things. You go, oh, something's wrong here. So in this case, this is the only use of this word in the entire New Testament. This is not the only place to, in the entire New Testament that this issue is addressed, and that's, that's going to be part of the context that's going to actually lead us to the truth here. Uh, and only Paul, only Paul uses this. Um, but that's okay, because we're going to be looking at this bigger context. We're going to be looking at other scripture. And even other scripture within the same sentence. Let's, let's just go there. Let's just make the scope a little bit bigger. It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, is what he says in his article. But that isn't even the... It's got a period at the end. It's not even the whole verse. No, the whole verse is, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Rather, she is to be in quietness. And this quietness, this thing, this whole thing keeps coming back again and again. The word authentine means to have authority over and linking this. So we're going to link this with that present desire. Remember, he's, that, that, uh, there's an active desire that he's going to permit or not permit. So when you link the authority over, uh, with this desire in, uh, by the women, uh, uh, implied by Paul's words, it's clear that women were desiring to teach and to take authority that was rightly assigned to men. So he goes on to his second point. Second, Paul typically uses the conjunction that links to teach with to seize authority, to convey a single idea. Okay, uh, he, he, has a, he has something he's written on the word ode uh, in something called Missing Voices. And of course, this is going to be about the missing the voices of, of women, probably. Um, broadening the discussion on men, women, ministry. And this is uh, edited by Hilary Ritchie. And there they look at, at answers and objections to illustrate this use of ode to combine two elements that contrast with something else. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's good scholarship. 
Consequently, he says, here's, here's where we're going to slip, Paul prohibits only women from seizing authority to teach. This does not restrict teaching by women with recognized authority. Ah, this is why we made that little distinction. This is why we cut the salami so thin before, because he wants to bring in a women with a recognized authority, which doesn't exist in the Bible. Indeed, Paul greets Priscilla. Well, there she is. She's always brought up. Who instructed Apollos in this same city in, in 2 Timothy 4, 19. That's right. She didn't teach in the church. She didn't usurp authority. She didn't exercise authority or take over authority. She helped out a fellow Christian. Women can spread the gospel. Women can talk about the gospel. So the word here for permit is, again, active. It's a desire to do. The women are desiring to teach, but Paul does not permit it as inspired by God. Only a willfully blind person, a willfully deceived person influenced by the world could try and make this verb only for a short so I would say, well, this verb is just like, well, don't do it right now. But, but later, maybe we will look at it again. And, and then limit it to a single location. The whole Bible has this same kind of theme. Uh, this is just deceptive. You might have an argument here, though. If, you know, it's, again, the salami and the peppercorn. You've got an argument. You've got a peppercorn here. Unless we all actually knew what salami was. And once you say, well, salami is made of peppercorn, anyone that knows about it says, no, you, you've, you've, you've got the wrong end of the argument. The silence that is required of women here is of not being a teacher. The subjection is the subje subjection to authority. So if you want to connect back within these couple of verses, those with what he was trying to do, which is good scholarship, you connect the silence linked with not being a teacher, and you connect the subjection to not taking over authority. That's the proper setup. That's the proper framework for this section. Now, I keep talking about the salami. <laughs> it's really dumb. I didn't plan to do that. It just popped into my head. But we talk about the con. Let's just go through the context. People say, oh, the context. And progressive Christians are really good at this. They say, oh, over here there was a... Roman text, and over there, there was something else. And if you look at all of Mike Winger's uh, very deep and scholarly study on this, you see that they say, oh, it's over there in that book, and this is what it means. And then if you, and they're counting on you not going and looking, but if you go and look, you open it, you say, wait a minute, it's not really relevant. And actually, it seems to be suggesting the opposite of what you're telling me. It happens more than once. It's, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. These are people who are trying to fit square pegs into round holes because the world, the flesh, and the devil have gotten a hold of them. So I'm going to give you some salami here. 1 Timothy 2.12. Well, that's kind of where we are. I do not permit a woman to cheat or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet or remain silent. 1 Corinthians 14.34. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. And we're not under the law, but he's saying also the law says that. In Titus 2, 1 to 15, uh, it says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound of faith, in love, and in st and steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So we're, we're, looking, we're looking at a, at a hierarchy here. Yes, and some people are allergic to high. We're looking at a hierarchy here. And the last one I'm going to show you here is from Luke. There was a prophetess 
uh, Anna, and this is Luke 2, 36 to 38. She was a daughter, daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. She lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Again, uh, th this is a prophecy uh, and not teaching and preaching and explaining and expositing the word of God. So context of the breadth of scripture is that women can proclaim the gospel. They can correct and incorrect teaching privately. Uh, they can play roles in the church of teaching other women and children. They can pray, uh, ask questions, uh, but they may not have the position and authority reserved for men any more than Christ can have the position and authority reserved for the Father. Number three. He says, third, the I do not permit is a misleading translation because the verb in Greek normally refers to something limited in time, not permanent. <laughs> Furthermore, its grammatical form here rarely conveys a permanent prohibition. And again, you might be right if this was the only sentence in the entire Bible, but you're not. You're looking at a very tiny word, and then looking at all the possible translations, and then picking the one that works best for you, and trying to build a theology on top of that. It usually focuses on presently ongoing permission or prohibition. So should be translated, I am not permitting. Okay, that might be true. I am not permitting, referring, he says, to the ongoing crisis of false teaching in Ephesus, not to a universal prohibition. Well, if there's an ongoing crisis of false teaching, wouldn't that apply to men as well? No, there's a clear teaching here about women. So it could be true, what he's saying, if it wasn't for all the other scripture that points it, if it wasn't for all the other salami that isn't made of peppercorn, he might have a point. And fourth, this is his final point, and then I'll, and I'll wrap up uh, this talk. Fourth, if this verse permanently prohibits women from teaching, it contradicts the Bible's many affirmations of women teaching. God revealed even key portions of inspired scripture through women, including the songs of Miriam. Was she teaching? She wrote songs and probably sang songs. No. That's in Exodus 15, by the way. Deborah in Judges 5. She was a judge. Uh, Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2. But she's not leading and exercising authority and expositing scripture. Abigail's prophecy. Again, it's a prophecy. Uh, the, uh, uh, the inspired utterance of King Lemuel's mother in Proverbs 31. Uh, and Elizabeth's blessing in Luke uh, 1, 25 and 42 to 45, as well as Mary's Magnificat, Luke 1, 46 to 55, which he says is the first Christian exposition of Scripture. But these are progressives, and they think you won't go look it up. But I did. Let's look at it. So here is what he says is the first exposition. So that's taking scripture or that's maybe and, and, and showing us the gospel. So this is the first exposition of Christian doctrine. It isn't. This is purely Jewish. It's purely Messiah. Um, and, and let's read it together. Mary's song, it's called. It's very nice. And Mary said, quote, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends 
to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their most inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So where's the salvation? Where's the Christian salvation, forgiveness of sins, repentance of the whole world, the cosmos, as as John refers to it um, most? It isn't here. This isn't the first Christian doctrine, theology. This isn't how you are saved. It's scripture. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It came from a woman. But this is not a woman taking leadership and authority from men in the church. It's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. It may be a gospel, it may be a set of good news, but this isn't the first Christian uh, exposition. Men and women are equal in value, in dignity, but woman comes from man, even though God formed her. And man names woman. You think about that. I've only heard one preacher ever say it. Man was naming the animals. And if you're going to name something, if you're in charge enough that you get to name it, that gives you a certain level of authority. To claim that a woman is wronged when her gifts and abilities are limited to her God-ordained sphere is to say that Christ is wronged or that men are wronged when they can't do things or are not supposed to do things outside of their sphere. Men are to teach, preach, and lead in the church, and if they do not, and they have not enough, then women will happily and competently take over. But their presence in leadership is an affront to Scripture. It is a satanic attack and it will exploit the worst in women to tear down the church, just as Satan is exploiting the worst in men to do the same. Nevertheless, men are to lead, and men, you are accountable. Remember, sin came in the world through one man. So wait a minute, wasn't it Eve who took the fruit and started? Yes, and Adam was accountable through one man, not through one woman. She was deceived, but sin came into the world and death through one man. Let's leave the last part here for the men. Because we men were first in creation, man, protos, first in rank, chief, Ish in Hebrew and and, the, and women are Isha. Uh, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Her fall confirms her need for a head. When she got out from under the protection of her husband, she fell. Now you can say, well, he was an idiot because, he, because m- many scholars think he was right there listening to the whole thing. Uh, that, that could be. But when she didn't defer to his leadership and Adam didn't defer to the leadership and mercy of Christ, he tried to solve the thing himself, uh, I think, and and, and other other, uh, some scholars do as well. Uh, When she got out from under the protection of her husband, she fell. She was designed with the need for a protector and a preserver because she is susceptible to deception without it. And as John MacArthur said, the weakness of a woman is susceptibility to deception, and the weakness of a man is that he needs a woman. So we need each other. That weaker vessel, the woman, is not weaker because she's inferior. She's weaker because of what her role is supposed to be. 
and a big part of that is childbearing, yeah, getting getting out from under the um, the shame of the curse. And the man is to be protector and provider, and that's how he is going to show love to the woman uh, as Christ shows love to the church and died for it. So that's all I've really got to say about this uh, article. You can uh, read a lot more about Philip Payne, P-Y-N-E, uh, on uh, the Christian Post. Uh, he's published some stuff. He's done some missionary work. Uh, you know, he's probably just, uh, just a brother in Christ, but uh, when we do see people slip, when we do see people going down the wrong road on these issues, uh, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to point it out and to help people see where the truth is. Because once you start looking at the peppercorns, you're going to populate your conscience with the wrong things. And what we need to do is we need to go from, you know, big like this, and we need to understand things in the context, because text without context is a pretext. Thank you.